Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly podcast in which we talk about all things Beatles, the past, the present, anything we feel like. And I'm Ken Michaels, one of the four regular co-hosts of this show. And you might know me from my other Beatles program, a syndicated radio show called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three other regular co-hosts, that being the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. Also, one of the writers for Beatle Fan Magazine, who has been with them since the very beginning, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. Alice is coming right out of his car right now as we speak. <laughs> ka-ching, ka-ching. <laughs> this is a very live show as we're recording it. Whatever we're doing in the in moment, the you can hear it. That's right. <laughs> there we go. It's like, this is like Eric Idle with the Rotos. Right. The man on the street there. And also we have our resident musicologist who writes for a number of different publications, and that includes Beatle Fan Magazine. That is Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. On the show this time out, we're going to be talking about a couple of, well, several news items that have happened in the past uh, week or so. Uh, first of all, I thought we'd just very briefly mention, because we just found out today, the very first report, although I must emphasize that it's unconfirmed, about uh, Paul McCartney's latest batch of remasters coming out. We've heard for quite a while that they would be tug of war and pipes of peace well the first report uh i've seen now on the internet is that they'll be coming out on september the 18th and uh, i do want to emphasize that we don't have any official word about this this is the first time that uh news with a date has actually leaked out this is the initial uh, announcement about it and uh, as we all know since we've all covered beetle news Dates have a way of changing as well. Things get postponed so many times. So uh, all that we're saying is this is the first report, September 18th, for those two remastered CDs. Guys, you want to comment about that? As far as the date itself goes, it's not necessarily the dates are get, get changed. It's that sources are not always, especially in reports like this, are not always correct. So, you know, I wouldn't put... A hundred percent trust in that, but we'll find out. You know, hopefully, we'll get uh, an announcement soon from uh, Concord. As as Ken said, um, uh, it's been reported for months that the the, the next two archive uh, releases are going to be Tug of War and uh, and Pipes of Peace, which make absolutely absolute sense because those two albums, perhaps more than any two in Paul's whole post-Beatles catalog are almost joined at the hip. Uh, Pipes of Peace is very much kind of a follow-up to Tug of War, although, you know, in the opinion of many, uh, Tug of War is a, much, uh, is a much better album, and it certainly was much more successful. But it, uh, but it, it does totally make sense that they would come out together as, as archive releases. Mm-hmm. Alan? Yeah, I mean, I think so, too, and I think that's one of the reasons that we've been hearing for so long that uh, that they would be released together, um, that plus maybe a certain amount of wishful thinking because so many people like particularly Tug of War mm-hmm. and the Pipes of Peace is the, the logical uh, companion for it. I, mean, I, I mm-hmm. guess what I wonder is um, whether – you know, unlike any of the previous box sets, which were absolutely all self-contained, um, whether there'll be any kind of linkage between these two, um, since they really do sort of go together so well. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, the songs on Pipes of Peace, many of them came from the Tug of War sessions anyway. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, how do you decide what bonus tracks belong on one album and one on the other? Right. So uh, it'll be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, and, I wouldn't be surprised if it was largely correct, that report, because it's been a while since the last couple of reissues. And, you know, I think he does want to keep that uh, that program going. Um, so you, you can't really wait a year between each reissue. It's He's got too many albums for that. None of us will sort of live through it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> very true. And they did uh, hint at it. In the last one with the card, you know, with the card. So, I mean, it, the fact that these two albums have been next up is, 
you know, is no big scoop. You know, mm. it's just the fact that we haven't actually had dates before this. So, there of course, no. he, could, he could just fake us out and put out Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Exactly. That's true. That's true. He could. Are there any clues as to what's going to be included? You know, for instance, Wog Blog sometimes uses guesswork, but a lot of times they do are they are able to kind of scoop uh, the the kind of material that's going to be in the sets, the, at least the the uh, you know the the expanded the deluxe versions. Haven't I haven't heard. I, I think the I mean the only way you could guess at that, and that really that's all you can do, is go back to whatever information about the sessions is there and see what, you know, what possibilities exist, you know, might exist. Mm. I don't think anybody can, I don't think there's going to be any, until the official announcement, I don't think you're going to know. I really don't. I mean, that, you know, blogs can guess all they want, but um, there's not going to be any um, solid information to go on. So. And probably what a lot of people will be thinking, as I will, is that whatever has been bootlegged, from those sessions, probably some of that will appear on here. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of material, a lot of demos yeah. from Tug of War. Um, I think those might find their way, although you never know with Paul. Yeah. You know, yeah. There, there's some, some things. The thing is, um, there's, there's an awful lot of bootleg material from those two sessions, mm-hmm. and for him to include most of it would mean a, a pretty big box set, which tends to be not what he does. What I kind of have liked about some of the previous ones is that in a lot of cases, he's gone past the ones that we already have and put out things that we don't have, which yeah. is which is kind of hmm. a nice, nice thing. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, my theory about bootlegs has always been that people who collect them like are, are collecting them because they love the material so much and would be perfectly happy to buy a legitimate one. So if they put out simply legitimate versions of the stuff on bootleg, I, I wouldn't really have a problem with that. But but the fact that we're getting stuff even beyond that, I think, is is really a good thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, just recently with Venus and Mars to have those demos of 4th of July. Right. And yeah. it's love. I mean, I never knew they even existed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's, so. he's been he, – you'd, th- you'd think he's watching the the bootleg market the way he's been dealing with that. So – I think he's pretty well aware of what's what's out there on bootlegs. I mean, he's always said, for instance, that he was going to put out cold cuts and ended up canceling it because it had already come out on a boot anyway. <laughs> it's you know? true. I, and I and I don't think he's he may be exaggerating or you know whatever, but but I think he's aware of what's out there. Mm-hmm. But he could always put out cold cuts and put a different variation of it or Absolutely. or tracks on there that haven't been bootlegged. Right. So mm-hmm. yeah. Except weren't there two or three different versions of cold cuts? Right. And uh, yes. and each time, you know, they would leak out, I guess he would say, okay, well, we won't do that, so mm-hmm. <laughs> let's move on to the next thing. Yeah. And then he's gone on to release a lot of that stuff legitimately yes, exactly. as bonus tracks. Yeah. Right. You know, like Same Time Next Year, songs right. like those. Yeah. Mama's little girl. Mm-hmm. All right, why don't we uh, talk very briefly about uh, Ringo's big celebration in Los Angeles, which took place at the Capitol Records Tower for his 75th birthday. I know, Steve, you did uh, a number of articles on this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's so many incredible people that showed up there, some friends friends and family, as you would expect, but uh, a few surprise things connected with this with this event as well. Well, the, the, I guess the biggest surprise that I mentioned that I wrote about was the fact that it's now sponsored by American Airlines. Um, and that was not mentioned in any of the, uh, in any of the advanced information. So, I mean, that was really kind of a surprise that, that, uh, that that's happened. And, um, you got to give, you know, uh, if that's the case, it's a great, uh, uh, way to look forward to that to the event in the in the upcoming years uh you know that opens up all sorts of possibilities so yeah i uh, you know that's that's pretty cool uh what but what and, does sponsored mean in this case i you know that that's a good question i you know because there was no advance information that american airlines had anything to do with this no, and when I, ringo and ringo dropped that, that information uh, on Chris Carter, there was no advance information on this at all, so we don't know. You know, there's no uh, 
There was yeah, nothing. I mean, you know, from, just because sponsorships usually mean that someone is paying some money to support whatever the endeavor is, if it's a if it's a game or a you know uh, a broadcast, whatever is sponsored mm-hmm. by. But 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 the peace and love thing is just everybody saying peace and love at noon on Ringo's birthday. I'm not sure what that costs and what <laughs> what the sponsorship yeah. needs to be. <laughs> Right, you know, I, I don't, I don't either. Um, that's yeah. yeah, that's probably maybe something he was joking. I should, I should, maybe yeah, it's I, possible. I, I, yeah, it's yeah, I, I, you know, he was. It was a pretty jovial phone call. Yeah, because mm. um, in so, the uh, in the background, you know, during the the ceremony, I didn't see any American Airlines logos or really any uh, any logos of any kind. Hmm. Well, maybe okay. it's also an event because of all the, the people that he invited there mm-hmm. and the fact that there was a band that played Ringo's music. Right. So it wasn't just a couple of minutes saying peace and love and goodbye. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, Joe Walsh had a little speech. Richard Lewis had a speech. Someone we always connect with Ringo. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. As well as somebody else who you, you immediately think of Ringo when you think of him, and that, of course, is, is Bud Court. Who was uh, a guest there? Yeah, I had to, re- I had to <laughs> refresh my memory of who Bud Court is. <laughs> I'd forgotten about you know, Harold and Maude. He was at Harold, Harold and Maude. Harold and Maude was part of Harold and Maude, uh, was filmed about uh, 15 minutes from where I'm sitting right now. Really? The part on The part on the bridge. Ah. That, that bridge, which no longer exists, right. was was very cl- is very close to. It still exists, obviously they rebuilt it, but right. it's still it's very close to yeah. where I am. And um, yeah, so that was kind of interesting. And of course, David, you know, you didn't mention David Lynch. Yep, who, him too. Who has probably the second worst hairstyle in the world outside of <laughs> Donald Trump? <laughs> um, <laughs> Except at least I think David's is real. Hmm. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Having seen it, having seen it close up, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. So. But I think but the yeah. important thing is that Ringo keeps doing this every single year. And yeah. I wasn't even aware until it was just reported that this is the 10th year he's doing this. Wow. I mean, really? I, I've only felt like it's been the last, I don't know, four or five yeah. years, but apparently it has wow. been 10. Ten years. So, uh, you know, it tells you how important this thing is to yeah. him. Right. And, uh, yeah. You see, there, there was an. There was an Access Hollywood clip that actually seemed to um, uh, allow Access Hollywood itself to take credit for this. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but they they brought out the clip from 10 years ago where they're saying to him, so so what are you doing for your birthday? And he said, what, what, what do you mean, what am I doing? <laughs> and and they start talking and he said, OK, how about this? Every Every year on my birthday at noon, everyone will say peace and love. So it really looks like the whole idea is actually happening at, at Access Hollywood, which maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But mm. but when they asked him the question about what he was doing, he actually did seem not to have any any idea and to just be coming up with this at the spur of the moment. Wow. So it's, it's kind of funny that oh, something huh. like that so off the cuff would have become um, a 10-year tradition for yeah. him. Yeah. Well, the press the press releases in advance did mention something about he was asked, you know, what he was going to do, and he and he uh, it, the the story did kind of fall somewhere like that, but it didn't say access. I don't remember if it said Access Hollywood or not. I'd have to look it up um, mm-hmm. and see. But apparently, it's it's it, it. You know, I mean, I really doubt there was a whole lot of planning into something like this. You know, right. I mean, it just doesn't see it. Do, just doesn't fit. As far as you know, it looks it it sounds like it was pretty off the cuff, and it's and it's gener- you know every year it generates all this advanced publicity, and you know and you know people like me write about it, and it you know it generates more advanced publicity and become you know and the L.A. Times covered it this year, and so and, and he's done it in a number of different cities because more often than not uh, during this. 10 year period, he's been on tour with the all star right. band. So that right. you know, one year mm. it was in New York, of course, famously. Uh, one year in Nashville, one year in Chicago, I think. Uh, one was in Germany. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and this year was also interesting because of the fact that there was the, um, the Ringo birthday celebration already planned at Capitol Records by um, Jerry Rubin. Not the 
we're not talking about the old no. um, Chicago Seven guy for right. those of you that are older, like as old as me. But no, this is long uh, dead anyway. Yeah, yeah. Right. This is a, <laughs> a guy, a, a guy, a Beatle fan in Los Angeles who organizes all these events at Capitol for every the, all the Beatles' birthdays and things like that. And they and they had already announced this before Ringo even had announced his. Uh-huh. And and when they announced it, I, you know, I went to Ringo's publicist and I said. Is it possible that Ringo is going to do something there? And there was no answer. And then, of course, they announced that there was, and and that just kind of sparked everything. And that I mean, usually those events at Capitol Records go on with no, with nothing. I mean, they're just basically a bunch of fans. And Chris Carter from Breakfast of the Beatles goes down there, and they cut cake and they sing. And and, but this year it was a, it was very special. It was a, you know, they had to, my, my understanding was they had to kind of separate, you know, they, they didn't have access to the star, you know, at noon, they mm-hmm. had to wait until three o'clock to have access to the star while Ringo was there. But yeah, it, uh, it was an interesting juxtaposition of two events on top of each other that had no connection, that had no connection, but they were both there to, to celebrate Ringo's birthday. So, mm. yeah. Well, we should still, uh, you know, say to Ringo that, um, you know, he should be applauded for doing this yeah. year after year. This is not just a fleeting thing for him. It's obviously something that's very important to him. And, and you're talking about social media. There was a page developed on Facebook, mm-hmm. Peace and Love, mm-hmm. as well as on Twitter. So fans can post their messages of Peace and Love and Happy Birthday, Ringo. And more and more fans got involved. And, so and, it became and, more of a, of a big deal and an event. Yeah. And one thing, and one thing you really have to, make note of is that it has not gotten political with Yoko. You know, I mean, look at Ringo versus Yoko. I mean, Yoko is very much a peace activist and Yoko is very political. Ringo is Ringo. Although Ringo has, I've seen quotes of Ringo being political in the past. This is not political. And, you know, for whatever reason, and I guess he does that because, you know, if it gets political, it gets, you know, you, you bring a lot of other, aspects to it sure but it has not been political at all it stayed very apolitical and i guess for that you have to kind of give him a little credit for that you know as making it i mean it's basically just a positive thing you know to create some positive uh uh a positive aura and you know that kind of stuff doesn't happen very often now you know? not these days it's true no so, you know, on that, in that respect, you have to give Ringo credit. And the other thing about, you know, how, how, you know, how great he looks. I mean, it's becoming, it's, you know, I, he doesn't like to talk about it, but it's becoming more and more, you know, uh, obvious that he looks so damn healthy. He and really he, does. Uh, when you consider that, you know, that he's 75, he looks and you have to fabulous. Give, yeah, you have to give him a whole lot of credit and, uh, you know, staying healthy at his age is uh, staying healthy. Staying healthy after 50 <laughs> is not easy. No, and, it's uh, not. <laughs> and yeah. And, um, so he's, he's doing such a great job. And, you know, I mean, he's, uh, the, um, advice he gave Chris Carter about, uh, you know, working out and not eating large amounts and being a vegetarian and going to the gym. And, you know, I mean, that's just a great, just great. That's just a great, uh, uh advice. And, um, I mean, if you're, it, it's just fantastic that he's, you know, especially given where he was, you know, earlier in his life, yeah. he's doing a great, he's doing a great job. Yeah. He's when really you see excited. pictures, when you see pictures of Ringo from the seventies, you know, say like the, the, say the, the, the second half of the seventies, and much of the '80s, boy, there's a big difference. Mm-hmm. I mean, Alan, did you talk? To, did you talk to him back then? Uh, no, I, I didn't talk to him till 1989. So he was already on the road to uh, healthiness. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, now he has to talk about how well he looks because everybody's asking him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He so does, uh, he, does, he, really, he, doesn't he doesn't voluntarily bring it up. You no, know, he but, but, he, but everybody, everybody's asking him now. So, uh, and another thing that, that I think people like about, about Ringo with regard to how healthy he looks is that he doesn't preach to people how to live. No. He just tells people how he lives. Yeah. So, you know, and, and like we just said, he's not going to voluntarily talk about this. You really have to bring it up to him. Mm-hmm. So. 
Yeah, no, no meat free Mondays with Ringo. <laughs> right. right. There, there's a, that's a great point. Yeah, that really is. Yeah. Although, although I bet he, I bet he does it, but I mean, yeah, you're absolutely Could be, right. but he just doesn't make a, a, you know, an event out of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, so uh, let's move on to another topic, and that is that Paul McCartney gave an interview to Esquire magazine uh, in the last week or so, and it got a lot of attention, especially, surprisingly, on Ringo's birthday. I saw it being mentioned quite a lot in the media. In fact, they even talked about it on CNN. And there was a number of topics that were brought up in this interview, uh, but one of them which got the most attention was about how John is being made to be a martyr now. So I thought that I would um, read his quote about that. Uh, let me get it out here. He says, when John got shot, aside from the pure horror of it, the lingering thing was, okay, well, now John's a martyr, a JFK. So what happened was... I started to get frustrated because people started to say, well, he was the Beatles. And me, George, and Ringo would go, "Uh, hang on. It's only a year ago. We were all equal-ish. Yeah, John was the witty one, sure. John did a lot of great work, yeah. And post-Beatles, he did more great work, but he also did a lot of not great work. Now the fact that he's now martyred has elevated him to a James Dean and beyond. So whilst I didn't mind that, I agreed with it. I understood that now there was going to be revisionism. It was going to be John was the one. That's the end of the quote there. So this is a a subject that Paul has brought up before. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily shock me that he's saying this. But I have noticed just in general, not in this just this interview, but other ones, as he's gotten older, he's getting more candid. He's being a bit more revealing about himself. Hmm. Maybe not as much as a lot of people would hope, (laughs) but he is opening up a lot more about his feelings. And evidently, this is still something that is bothering him. So how do you guys feel about Paul's comments there about John the martyr? How about we'll start with um, Alan? Um, Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can understand where he's coming from there. And I can see how, from his perspective, that can be a little irritating, but he is also ignoring the fact that in 1970, there were people saying John was the Beatles and John was still, you know, alive. Um, I think that, I think that possibly his having got shot, uh, made it, you know, put it in higher relief, you know, because obviously there were going to be all the specials about him. And I mean, it's simply the way the media works and the way people think, you know, someone dies, then you focus on aspects of their career. And, but, but really, I mean, there've always been partisans really for all, all of them, I, I think probably, but certainly between John and Paul. I mean, we've, we've talked about this before that at the time of the breakup, the, there was the, People were really kind of divided between whether John was the real force of the Beatles or whether Paul was and whose solo work at the very beginning was better and whose wasn't. And so mm-hmm. um, so it's a battle he's been fighting for an awful long time. He just now has more of a, a focus for it, you know, and I suppose <laughs> what's the alternative? I mean, if you know, God forbid he'd have been shot. I mean, what, what would mm-hmm. he prefer, having been shot and become the martyr or – having to survive and live through the other bad guy being called the martyr, you know. I'm not sure if he was shot, whether he would be called, the, you know, the people would have been saying that he was the Beatles, you know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know about have, that. Yeah. I don't know. I think when, when if, if the same thing had happened to him, there'd be a lot of people saying, where would we be without Hey Jude? And Yesterday. Where would we be without Yesterday, Let It Be, you know, the, the really iconic songs, Eleanor Rigby. You know, those songs that Paul so well identified with. Right. When somebody dies, and especially it's magnified times 100 if you die young, mm. then you really concentrate on that person's contributions more so than the others. Right. And I think that Paul, to his credit, has tried very much to, to try to get the public to think the Beatles were a collaboration. It was the four of them. Mm-hmm. And I always remember... When, when Paul was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame five years after John, which was an insult, as soon as he got inducted, he said, come on, guys, George and Ringo are next. So he wanted all four of them 
to be recognized for their contributions. He didn't. He never said the Beatles were John Lennon and the Beatles or Paul McCartney and the Beatles. Mm -hmm. The Beatles were John, Paul, George, and Ringo. It was the four of them together, and they all made massive contributions to the group. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's understandable how this can really irk him. And um, all these years later, it still evidently bothers him. Right. So instead of being comfortable with what he's achieved, and I'm sure many of us would say, you know, lighten up already. <laughs> we know what you've done. We know what John's done. You know, you can't tell him how to feel because he was one of them, and he's observing this all these years. Sure. So, you know, he is human, which sometimes people forget. Mm -hmm. So anybody I, else I, out? Yeah, Go ahead, well, Steve. Well, I, I found and I was looking through – Keith Badman's off the record too today, and I found an interesting. This is from '81, which obviously is after John's passing, but he's talking about Philip Norman's uh, book, and he said, and "I'm not going to read the whole passage because this is very long, but I'll read a couple of parts of it." He says, "I hated shout for the way I am portrayed in it. The contrast between myself and John, so assiduously cultivated by journalists, was fabrication." I wasn't brilliant at school. I was troubled just like John. I got caned practically every day, and the only exam I passed was, in, was Spanish. But then further down, further down in the same quote, um, he says, What the book says about me being the great manipulator simply isn't true. Nothing happened in the Beatles unless everyone wanted it to happen. But when there was a decision to be made, somebody had to say it out loud, and that usually turned out to be my job. I accepted it. And I I read that and I read what he just said there and I think, you know I think you can you can um, put some weight on on things that he says now, but I think you have to kind of look at it, you know you have to kind of not take it real seriously, because I think you know depending on the time and the you know and and the circumstances he's going to say different things that we all know how he's changed stories. You know, um, you know, I don't know what to say there as far as I, I mean, I just don't take that very seriously. I don't take either one very seriously, really, because he just he he just says what he wants to say. Um, he's always been so public relations oriented. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, um, guy, anybody want to want to say anything? Well, about that? you have to you have to consider that the Lenin was a martyr comment came late in a in a fairly long discussion about first the you know the Lennon McCartney songwriting partnership and why it was Lennon McCartney and not McCartney Lennon and then the relationship with Yoko and uh, various and sundry other things and then you come to the uh, you know to the point where after John was killed, and and of course this is something that, uh, uh, as Ken mentioned, that uh, uh, that that Paul has mentioned uh, in the past. I guess it was probably about eighty two that he made a mention of uh, of John and you know again a, an out of context uh, uh, quote in an interview as uh, Martin Luther Lennon. Uh, mm -hmm. And so obviously this is this is something that has bugged him for for a long time. Uh, you know, just the mere fact that you've got those Steve, that you've got those quotes there from '81, uh, so soon after not only not only so soon after John's murder, but also so soon after the Philip Norman book itself came out. Uh, so obviously this is this is something that is kind of a burr in his saddle for a long time. And so even though he's, uh, you know, he and Yoko have a much better relationship than they, than they once had and all, still he has, uh, you know, the relationship, at least publicly, the public relationship um, between John and Paul still bothers him. No question mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. And seeming well, and seemingly the comments that Yoko periodically made, yes. uh, you know, he he quotes her in this one is saying, well, you know, John was the Beatles. Paul just booked the studio. I mean, yeah. I can see how if you're Paul, that would really bother you. Oh, and, yeah. and, and there have been yeah. other times, too, where she said, you know, John was Mozart and Paul was Salieri. And, uh, you mm. know, I, I don't I don't know. I have no idea why she does these things, but um, and, and possibly he should just ignore them. But uh, but you can see how they 
you know, obviously bother him and, and he feels periodically in interviews that they need to be addressed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, even, I'd like to, even fairly recently, she made a comment about Ringo that Ringo was the, I forget what it was, the most popular of the four or what, but, uh, yeah. was, was that it? Yeah, yeah. She did say that. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that, <laughs> I'm sure that went over real well with Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's something else that I'd like to bring up here, and I think this is really important because a lot of people aren't aware of the fact that the Beatles were so unique as a band. Sure. I mean, how many bands out there, can you say, had four members where you had two main songwriters, a third songwriter who still wrote quite a lot, mm -hmm. and even the fourth member wrote a couple of songs in there? Right. And then as musicians, they all contributed so much to each other's songs. And a lot of people want everything to have a simple explanation as to what the Beatles were. And it's not that simple, mm -hmm. because all four of them made su such big contributions to their music. And still to this day, we don't know everything about them. Mm -hmm. And we're never going to know everything about them. It's like I, I brought it up many times here on this show when we saw the documentary of Living in the Material World and Paul brought up And I Love Her and George wrote the, the guitar part, the, you know, the four notes, mm -hmm. da, 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 um, mm -hmm. you know, and I had never heard that before. So you're always learning new things about what the Beatles contributed to each other's music. It isn't just as simple as that's a Lennon song, that's a McCartney song. True, you could say that in the majority of songs the Beatles did as a group, Whatever song John sang lead to was mainly his song. Mm -hmm. Whatever song Paul sang lead to was mainly his song. But how do you know the other guy didn't make some big contribution to the song sure. in some way? Yeah. Whether it's yeah. changing one line, whether it's approving a line, like the movement you need is on your shoulders. Right. I mean, right. John Lennon didn't write that line, but that song might have been changed had he not approved it. Yeah. You know, there's so many ways that each of the four of them made contributions to the band. And I'm saying this only because I see so many instances online where people say the stupidest things about the Beatles that are completely inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And they don't know. And I think Paul is very concerned about the way the story of the Beatles is brought out to the public, whether it is accurate or not. And that's why he wrote a song like Early Days. Yeah. He, he talked about this young girl who came up to him and said she was taking a class on the Beatles, and Paul told her some story about something that happened with them, and she said to him, no, that's not the way it happened. <laughs> I mean, when you're reaching a point where the fans think they know more than they do, <laughs> give it up already. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it's one thing to be a historian, and it's it's... It's great to study all this stuff, but we're never going to know as much as those four guys knew. They lived it. And the whole process of what the Beatles did creatively and what their relationships were is so complicated that we'll never know everything. No. And there are fans out there that think they know everything. Oh, yeah. And I see it all the time online. And Paul even made the comment here about, when you buy a Beatles song on iTunes, they have limited space on the screen. So sometimes all you see is John Lennon dot, dot, yes. dot on the song. Well, how do you know someone who is young, who hasn't learned anything about the Beatles, is likely to think, oh, that's a John song? Yeah. You know, not everybody is educated and knows everything about the Beatles. It takes a lot to learn everything about the Beatles. Mm -hmm. So I understand his frustration in all this. Yeah. Yeah, very, very, very much so. Uh, yeah, uh, well, although Mark Lewison, who certainly does know, you know, a, a goodly amount, uh, Absolutely. even he has yeah. said that he thought that, you know, that early, that uh, early days, uh, I think his quote was that Paul was having, a, was having a go at him because I guess he, um, maybe was somewhat self-conscious about, uh, whether Paul thinks that, uh, uh, Mark is sort of making himself out to be the, you know, the ultimate authority on the Beatles. Although, of course, the amount of research that he's done is mind-bogglingly magnificent. It's, it's staggering. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but I don't know if Mark would ever say I know more about the Beatles than no. Paul McCartney. No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely. He's probably the last person that would say that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas, yeah, you know, again, you know, that that shows you just how much ignorance goes on on these uh, on social media. 
you know, which I'm getting more and more and more disgusted with because there is all of this, you know, the, these people, you know, they, you know, they have the, uh, uh, you know, the, they can make whatever comments they want, you know, no matter how stupid they are. And, uh, you know, nobody's going to check them on it unless they confront them and then, and then it degenerates into, uh, you know, into a pissing match. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, so it's, uh, you know, I, 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 unless there are people who I know as being, authorities or at least being very knowledgeable uh i take most of what i see online about uh, about the beatles with about uh, uh, a couple of uh, shakers full of salt mm-hmm. yeah i think you can well, extend that thing... beyond beyond the beatles i'll tell you oh absolutely oh please <laughs> and the, the sad thing is that once you post something online people read it and are influenced yeah. by it very true. And some people automatically believe it yeah. instead of doing the research and trying to learn more themselves. So, uh, you know, I understand why he's, why he's upset because um, the majority of bands that we've had in the history of, of popular music have usually one lead singer, maybe one or two songwriters. It's not as complicated as the Beatles. And I'm not saying that other bands don't have each member adding something to the group sure. and contributing, but the Beatles in every single way added so much to each other's music. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, unless you understand that, and a lot of fans don't, right. you know. So I understand what it's like to to really support the songwriter because he wrote the song, and definitely I'll always associate the song with the songwriter first, mm-hmm. but the Beatles brought so much to each other's songs in many ways and, you know, to be a, a real fan and to appreciate them, you have to study that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, to, to single out John for his great contributions, and there's no doubt he made so many of them, you, you can't discount the other three. Yeah. I can remember <laughs> so. back in the 70s, there was, a, there was a phrase that went around that said that, the, that when it came to the Beatles, the sum of the whole did not equal the whole itself. You know, meaning people, and you know, people who felt that they're, that there's, that the post Beatles recordings, and I know there's going to be disagreement here, but that the, uh-huh. uh, that the, uh, the quality of the post Beatles work of the individual Beatles was not up to the quality of the group's work. Mm-hmm. So the sum of the whole does not equal the whole itself. Well, that's another show yes. for us. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Because <laughs> that's, that's where I would disagree. Right. But, um, you know, it's, it's such a long conversation yes. to have on that particular topic. Yeah. But, you know, that's why I understand where Paul's coming from here. Right. So, um, yeah. The other thing he did comment on, among other things, was that he did feel that probably there will never be another band that will have the same impact as the Beatles. So, and that's a topic that we can certainly do an entire show on on whether or not we feel that could ever happen again so um you know it's definitely a very interesting interview as i said i think that paul is loosening up a bit more and saying how he feels you know that's the the one thing he said there about uh with john solo music that he he did some great work and not so great work Mm -hmm. i'd love to know what he thought was his great work and not so great work Mm -hmm. because one of the things that that um, I often wish about all four of the Beatles was that they would have commented more about their own solo work and the other three's solo work yeah. and what they thought was their best. And you only have a few, really, just, you know, a few slight examples here and there where one of them will say, like, George liked I'm Carrying mm-hmm. <laughs> Paul's song or, or that would be something, you know, or that Paul liked Beautiful Boy. There's like a few isolated examples here and there. But I'd love to know Paul's thoughts about not only his own music, but the other three Beatles solo music. Plus the fact that, um, you know, John's post Beatles career, of course, was so tragically short. But and, right. and the the majority of it was in the first half of the 70s, which was during that period when they were uh, very much, uh, very much on the outs with each other. So mm-hmm. it. It stands to reason that uh, that Paul probably would not have had much positive um, positive or negative to say about uh, about John's work at that point. 
because and that depends on on whether or not he associates his relationship with him with the music, which really is a separate thing. Well, yeah. Plus the fact that at that point he was really so busy trying to push Wings, mm. and uh, you know really didn't comment very much uh, on anything other than you know his own music or the group. You know, he really didn't, uh, and even Beatles' comments were kind of short and, you know, get them out of the way, you know. Uh, so he really right. so he really didn't make much in the way of comments at that time about really any of the others. Yeah, but I'm just saying in general, mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. these years, yeah. even to this, you know, they, they rarely do talk about each other's solo music. Mm-hmm. And when George was alive, he didn't do that. Yeah. You know, so... Uh, you know, I wish I knew their thoughts of what they felt was, you know, their strongest work and not so strong work. I love seeing uh, a few years ago there was a DVD that came out on the Plastic Ono Band and you had Yoko in there and Klaus Foreman and Ringo. And Ringo was talking about how much he loved being a part of that album and some of his drumming he loved. He thought that it was amongst his strongest on certain songs. You know, I love hearing that. So I just wish that there was more of that. Well, plus, in, you know? in Paul's case, I think he may not have been doing all that much listening to the others' uh, catalogs. Because, for instance, in, in 2002, when he you know appeared at the, uh, the concert for George, uh, and I think Eric Clapton talks about this uh, in uh, one of the two versions of the film, uh, that it... When they when Paul came to the rehearsals and it was decided that uh, that he was going to do the song All Things Must Pass, at least according to Clapton, it seemed it seemed to him that Paul was really not all that familiar with the song at all. You know, even though That's... even though the Beatles had performed it, uh, not performed yeah. it, but that had they had played it during the uh, the Twickenham. Uh, rehearsals uh, for the Get Back album. Um, it seemed that Paul really didn't know that song very well at all. And uh, and in fact, even when they performed it uh, at the concert for George, at the very end of it, you can see Paul kind of take a backward glance at, at Eric as if to say, did I do it okay? <laughs> you know? So he may well, not have done, been doing all that much listening to the others, uh, the others' music. That really is shocking to me. Mm. I mean, I, I can't imagine all four of them not following each other's music, you know, regardless yeah. of what their relationships were like at that mm-hmm. moment. So, you know, there are some people who think they were watching over each other's shoulders. Yeah. Maybe that wasn't apparently, the case. Yeah, apparently not. Hmm. Anyway, uh, I thought that we'd bring up this whole idea uh, of something that we discussed uh, several shows back, which is this... Um, this idea that Paul, speaking of revisionism, mm-hmm. Paul is a revisionist. And, and um, I know I asked Al to come up with a few examples of what he thinks of, of Paul revising history. And um, I thought we'd bring up those points here and hear what each of us have to say, because we only very quickly mentioned it in the show um, when we first talked about this. And I do want to defend... Uh, Paul, and, and I guess in all instances. But the first one would be uh, when Paul has said that the Beatles swore they wouldn't come to America until they had their first number one hit. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess you'll remember, Al, mm-hmm. going back to when I had my show on WDHA. Sure. I even brought this up, and I was ripping him apart sure. for saying that because I thought exactly what you're thinking. You know, he didn't actually say we wouldn't go on Ed Sullivan or he wouldn't go on American television. What I think Paul really meant to say, and it's all in the way that it's worded, is that the Beatles wouldn't tour America until they had a number one. Because when he has explained this before, and you could actually listen to this in the McCartney interview album that came out in 1980, Mm -hmm. he would often bring up the example, and he has brought this up a few times, of Cliff Richard. Mm -hmm. Right was the biggest name in England. He was their Elvis Presley. And someone like a Cliff Richard would come to America, they'd be like fifth on the bill on a tour, and they wouldn't have any impact or make any splash at all. And the Beatles didn't want that. They wanted to be, they wanted to come to America at a time when they had a big hit. They had a number one hit. 
So I think what Paul really meant to say was that the Beatles wouldn't tour until they had a number one. It's all the way that he worded this. In fact, I even went back, because I know I brought this up before, but I listened back to an interview that that I did with Mark Lewis, and this is before all those years came out. Mm -hmm. And we brought up this very same topic, and he agreed with me that he thought that that's really what Paul meant. It just wasn't worded properly. It sounded kind of awkward. It sounded kind of cocky in a way, because it's very easy easy to misinterpret that as if to say, oh, we wouldn't come to America like beyond Ed Sullivan, unless we had a number one. Um, I really think that he meant that they wouldn't tour the States. Well, in, so, in fact, in um, probably the first book, that really showed the Beatles as being, you know, really human and not just, you know, teen idols. Uh, uh, the book called uh, Love Me Do by Michael Braun, who toured with the Beatles uh, in the fall of 63 in England and then again when the, uh, in Paris in January of 64 and then when they came to America. Um, uh, in, in a conversation from the fall of 63, Paul was talking about Cliff Richard. And talking about how, you know, jo when, when George was in St. Louis uh, in September, he had seen Summer Holiday, which was one of Cliff's uh, big films in England, playing second mm. bill on a double feature at a drive-in. And, right. and Paul said, and I don't have the quote in front of me, but basically said, I don't know. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if America really needs us. I'm, I'm not sure how well we'll, uh, we'll actually make it in America. This is probably in November, October, November of, of 63. Uh, the only, only problem that I have is that in the, the film that is supposed to be kind of the, you know, the, the you know, the Beatles on record about their story with the anthology, Paul says the basically the same thing, you know, that he'd been saying in some of these uh, some of these interviews that we were, you know, we were determined that we weren't going to come to America until we had a uh, until we had a number one hit. So, right, you know, uh, maybe it's just the way he um, the the way he words it, but you would think that that you know, particularly for that, uh, you know, kind of on the record. Statement, he would have maybe parsed his words a little better. Yeah, and unfortunately, whenever if he's brought this up in an interview, nobody counters him with it. Yeah. So we're not going to know exactly what he meant yeah. by saying that. that's true because most of the interviewers they don't you know they're clueless. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Alan, how do you feel about this? I mean, yeah, I I actually always had sort of thought that that was a, a strange comment to make and also the way that in the anthology they juxtaposed it with George saying uh, well yeah it was handy that we had a number one hit because we were booked to go there anyway right um, but your explanation which I hadn't really heard before uh, you know sounds sensible I mean it's, it's very possible that he simply wasn't speaking as precisely as he should uh, and that he really meant come to America on tour. I, I can accept that. Um, it, it just, it, it just sounds the way he did put it. Um, and, mm. and, and he does know the language yeah. the way he did mm. put it. It does make it sound like, you know, we just weren't going to go there at all until we had a number one hit. Mm -hmm. So, so I don't know, I guess it's a question of interpretation as, as you say, we'll never really know what he actually meant, but, um, yeah, unless somebody asks him directly. Yeah. That's true. Okay. That's true. Steve, your thoughts? Well, I mean, you know, we've had so many instances of Paul saying things and not knowing, you know, I mean, being different, you know, later on. I, you know, I, I just, I, I always take whatever he says with a grain of salt, you know, even interviews, you know, like this. Uh, you know, I don't think there's no definitive word as far as I'm concerned with him. So, yeah. Well, I don't think he changes his opinions that often. I think he's been consistent with this. Mm, I, I still, you know, there's been so many, you know, as you guys say, interpretations and so many different, you know, it seems like, you know, depending on the circumstances, again, like I said earlier, I mean, he'll say, he'll say one thing and then turn around and say another. I, I just, I don't, I, I really don't take much of, uh, 
you know, what he said seriously. I mean, and the, you know, the song, the song on new is, is just another, you know, just another interpretation really. So. Mm. All right. Well, certainly that's the way that I feel about what that particular comment was. So, um, why don't we do another one? This is one that Al brought up as well when Paul has discussed Back to the Egg, which I really think, you know, his comments weren't that big of a deal anyway, mm. but often he'll say that, uh, you know, certain albums that we thought weren't, didn't do that well. We look and we saw that it went to number eight. Right. But I think that, um, you know, whereas there are a lot of artists out there that would kill to have a number eight album, probably, uh, what I'm thinking is, is that when Back to the Egg came out overall, in terms of sales, it was a disappointment. And um, certainly the people at CBS thought that way. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Paul was used to having number one albums. Mm-hmm. And even London Town, which went to number two, I'm sure to some people, maybe even to Paul, was a disappointment. You know, when you're used to having number ones and for some reason you start to slip, he's probably reacting to the initial success or lack of of that album so that's just why i think he said what he said i didn't think he meant to put down back to the egg but that's just my thoughts about that it's kind of like i i, I want to make a parallel here because i just recently saw the movie love and mercy oh yeah which i thought mm-hmm. was, was i thought in many ways was a great movie yeah, it's not perfect but uh the acting in that movie is just superb yeah. but um they do reenact the pet sounds sessions and uh, one of the members of the group, I'm trying to remember if it was Mike Love or not, was reacting to the fact that Pet Sounds hadn't sold that well. It was Mike. Initially. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, you know, obviously now it's looked at as being a masterpiece. But when it first came out, it didn't do that well. And I'm sure that in the eyes of the group, it was a disappointment. So to think of it that way, it's just he's remembering, Paul's remembering, that the album didn't do that well. Yeah. So that's probably why he said what he said. Although, I don't think he was trying to really cut down the album. Although in the case of Pet Sounds, it did reach the top ten. Right. And, and of course, in England, it was absolutely massive. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, um, that's true. And, 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 and obviously not only, uh, not only Mike Love's uh, interpretation, but also Capitol Records, who about a month after Pet Sounds came out, put out a hastily assembled Best of the Beach Boys uh, album Mm -hmm. to try to make up the sales that they felt they had lost from Pet Sounds. So I guess everything's, I guess everything's relative. Yeah, it it is, uh, it is strange that, uh, that even an album like London Town, which was, uh, as you said, a, a number two album, yeah, I think Paul also may consider that to be a disappointment because, for instance, with A Little Luck, which was a number one record, right? Mm. Uh, right. He's never performed in the entirety of his uh, live career. He's never performed that song. Well, you know, when, when Wings toured in 79, the UK tour, I know that Paul did say that he rehearsed the song and it just didn't work out well. Mm. So... um he did perform I've Had Enough from London Town. Yeah. So it's not like he was completely dismissing that album. Right. So, uh, yeah. But, um, you know, London Town would have been a number one album if it wasn't for Saturday Night Fever. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, you know, it was still a successful album by most accounts. Mm-hmm. But, you know, where Back to the Egg is concerned, it's probably Paul's remembering his initial reaction to the album not doing as well as he and they wanted it to. Mm. So. Yeah, uh, that's true. But uh, it, uh, you know, and, and and again, even even there, it was a top ten. It was a top ten album. So, right. So you know, to kind of uh, slough it off as a mistake, although I don't, I don't think he's actually referred to it as a mistake, but he's he's kind of disowned it over the years. Mm. You know, you know, certainly in not uh, certainly in comparison to his, uh, you know, the albums from earlier in the seventies, especially the mid seventies Wings albums. Mm. You know? All right. Anybody else want to comment on this? I guess not. Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and finally, the last uh, bit of revisionism, if you want to call it that. That's why we're debating this. All concerns the song Blackbird. Right. And, uh, mm. you know, 
we've talked about this before, and I remember when Paul started saying in concert that this was a song that he wrote to reflect upon all the problems going on in America, you know, the, the, the uh, racial problem, mm-hmm. and he wanted to write a song for women. And when I heard Blackbird growing up my whole life, I thought it was about a bird flying away. Yeah. <laughs> and it, and right? it's become now the symbol of, of freedom um, for black people or, I don't know, black women, black people. So the question remains, do we think that when Paul wrote this song, that was his original intent? And we had a couple of people writing in, including our regular listener, Michael Lynch. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm going to read an email from another listener, Andy Fitzsimmons, who wrote in, Hi, Ken, I really enjoy things we said today, but I was very surprised to hear the discussion about Paul revising the meaning of Blackbird. Contrary to what your co-host said, Paul did indeed tell Donovan in 1968 the song was inspired by race riots in America. This can be heard on a currently up YouTube clip, Paul McCartney and Donovan, 1968-69, at about the four-minute mark. Paul jokes about Diana Ross not liking the song, then says immediately after that joke that it was indeed inspired by black race riots, to the surprise of Donovan, who thought it was just about birds and their color. I don't know whether the first thick Liverpool English accents made this confusing, but Paul is saying... (laughs) Great reaction. (laughs) But Paul is saying contemporaneously and privately that the song was inspired by civil rights. He has not revised the meaning of the song at all. It is fascinating to me that Paul's songs can be so subtle in their meaning that everyone, including me, can have no idea what they are actually about. And then when he publicly reveals their meaning in many years from now, he can be accused of making it up to appear more more serious. Luckily, there is a bootleg showing that was the case. But it makes you think about people who are so suspicious of Paul's explanations. I loved the song when I thought it was just about a blackbird, but I have a deeper appreciation knowing what it was inspired by. Okay, yeah, so what do you guys think about that letter? Well, just one one little thing about that is that the night after the tr- shootings in Charleston, South Carolina, Paul played in, I think, in Greensboro. I think that was the night that Rick Glover came on stage. Mm-hmm. And yet when when Paul did Blackbird, there was no mention of what had happened the night before. And you would have thought that, you know, especially in that part of the country, unless he was like totally, you know, uh, totally ignorant of what had happened, it's it's possible because he is fairly sheltered. So he might not have heard about the uh, the reports of the shooting, but it, it just seemed a little weird that he didn't make at least some comment. Now, I, I think the next night, he did. Um, he he did. Mm, I'm trying to remember now. Uh, Steve may remember. Um, he did make a dedication, I think, at uh, the the next concert afterward, uh, which was also well, in the south. Yeah, but right, I'd have to well, look it up. But yeah, yeah, he did exactly. You're right. He did. Right. He, did. Uh, he he did it at South Carolina, and he did it before that at the Firefly Festival. Right. Yeah, well, in, in I mean, well, yeah. I mean, he does it now in, in almost every concert. He does. He does Blackbird. Uh, no, I'm talking but, about dedicating dedicating uh, the Long and Winding Road. Oh, yes, that's yes, you're right. Yes, that's true. That's mm. yeah, that's very true. But it um, but it just seemed weird that the the night after this, you know, uh, fairly devastating event, that there was no reference to it in a song before he performed a song, which is supposedly about the civil rights movement. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe you're making too much of it's, that. It's, yeah, Should it's it? very possible. I may, I may be reading entirely too much into it, but, um, you know, that's, uh, it just, it, it just piqued my interest. Let's put it that way. Okay. Alan, how do you feel about this? Um, well, I'm familiar with the recording that he mentions, and I'm familiar with the part where he plays Blackbird and then jokes that Diana Ross was offended about it. Um, I, I don't recall hearing the 
hearing him saying that it actually was inspired by civil rights, but I mean, I have it, I'll listen to it again. And, uh, and, uh, you know, maybe it's there. I, I, I'm, I'm not doubting his word. Um, if he's heard that, maybe it was, maybe it was mumbled and I just didn't catch it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I've listened to that recording a number of times and I don't recall hearing that part. Um, it would be interesting if, if that's the case, if he actually does say directly that that's what it was. And in, in that case, you know, I, I take it all back. Right. Hmm. How about you, Steve? I've always had trouble taking the, taking that seriously that he, that that song actually had any connection to civil rights at all. It just doesn't make sense that it, that it, that it would, um, you know, I mean, the, the lyrics are, I mean, I, it, it's such a beautiful song and I'm not to, not to say that you can't write beautiful songs about civil rights, but the words and everything just don't have any connection as far as I'm concerned. Uh, as far as I can, you don't, hear. you don't think, you don't think that the, the lyrics about a blackbird, you know, taking their broken wings, learning to fly, that could be a metaphor for black people having freedom? I suppose, it, I suppose it could, but not, it's not something he, you know, I mean, he never mentioned it until we heard it, you know, until he said, started talking about it in concert. I mean, it was never something, you know, except for the, the Donovan clip, assuming that that is what he said there, but it's just, it, it, it's just having not heard that or having him not say that over the years, it's just hard to, I don't know. It's, it, it's, well, this, this is something that, and even Michael Lynch brought this up to me, and we've spoken about this. What makes everybody think that we know everything there is to know about the whole Beatles catalog? I know so much has been written about it, but there's, there's still the possibility that there's things to learn. I mean, when a year ago, uh, Paul said that he helped write being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, some fans were up in arms about that. And Paul didn't say he wrote half of it. He might have written one line in it. You know, a lot of it was taken from the, the circus poster. But the minute that Paul seems to, the minute that Paul says anything new about any of this music, it's very possible that no one ever asked him about Blackbird. So it never came up in conversation. There's still quite a lot that we can learn about any of their songs. So it just seems like a lot of fans seem to think that everything's been written about the Beatles that could be written, although I'm sure with Mark Lewison's work, that's going to be proven to be very wrong. Or, or <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but there's still, there's still plenty to learn about this music, and it's very likely that we don't know everything, and we'll no, probably I, never know everything. I, I understand, I understand that completely. It's just that it doesn't make logic, logical sense given the, the words, given the, the whole atmosphere of the song, that it, it has anything to do with that. I mean, it just doesn't, I just don't get the, uh, it's not that I don't get the connection, it's just that there, the disconnect between when the song came out and now and not having, or uh, recently and not having said anything for so long, it's not something that you're going to sit there and go, oh yeah, that's right, you know. Um, I mean, you know, if, if obviously if that's what he says, that's what he says, you know, I mean, but it's just, I'm just saying that you know, as you were saying, it caught everybody by surprise. You know, I mean, it, 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 when people, you know, when he started saying that, they were going, really? You know, so, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's just a, you know, I mean, it's just one of those things. I mean. Plus, he began performing it in 75, 76 with Wings. And right. in the, you know, pretty much the, the, the standard patter of the show made no reference to that at all right. he just did the song and i don't i'm not sure exactly when it was that he began talking about the song being about uh being about civil rights it seems mm. to me it was like well, 10 years ago you know i think it's longer i think it was more that, longer than that but uh, think so? uh i'm not sure you know exactly when you know uh, but, you, but you would think if that was the case if he was performing it with wings that would have been the time to mention it because there was so much civil rights activism going on at the time. Mm -hmm. So it I don't doesn't... know. Paul Paul didn't say all that much in concert. No, that's that's true. And during no. '76, uh, he really did not talk very much in those shows. 
Certainly no. not not to the extent that he does now. Yeah. No, true. true. So, you know, it was more, are you having a good time? Yeah, you know, right, that kind of thing. You ready to rock and roll? Right. All that. That's basically what he says in concert. Right. You know, right. he gets the crowd working up, you know. <laughs> that's what he does in concert. He doesn't he doesn't give these great speeches. Mm. You know, he's prepared more stuff in recent years yes. and they usually tend to be it tends to be a formula, mm-hmm. you know, that he that it's the same speech almost every single time with not much variation. In fact, somebody but, uh, uh, somebody brought up very recently that he seems to be talking more and more that it's the the, the, the his shows are almost becoming like uh storyteller shows. Because he seems to have a story for every song. Hmm. Well, I wouldn't say every no, song. No, not every but song, but a he's, lot. He's been, he does. He does talk about a lot of them now. Hmm. Well, he's opened up a bit more. Yeah. You know, like I said, not only in his interviews but on stage, he's a little bit looser now. So, but usually everything is this, has always been very controlled with him. You know, in concert. So, you know, it's there's there's. There's nothing that says that he had to have said this 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago for it to be true. Mm -hmm. If he feels Mm -hmm. like talking about it now, you know, there may be information about a Beatles song that he brings up later on that we never knew. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that's just the way it is. If he's not confronted on specific songs, if it's just him voluntarily bringing it up. You know, that's up to him to decide what he wants to. And I think what what gets some people upset is those people are generally Lennon fans and they feel that, well, John's not here to defend himself and say whether or not Paul had anything to do with the writing of being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. You know, right. Paul's, you know, Paul's, uh, you know, taking on that, uh, that role, even though, uh, you know, because John's not here anymore, that kind of thing. Mm. All right. Well, that pretty much brings the show to a close. Before we end the show, we do have a brand new Twitter account. So, Steve, you want to tell the folks about that? Yes. It's, uh, the, the, uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, it's the at sign, the, you know, the usual Twitter sign, and it's things we said fab. So there you go. Okay. And we still have our Facebook page at Things We Said Today, so please like us there. And we have our own email account, which is Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. Um, I want to invite all of our listeners to write to us here and comment about anything they like, uh, any of the topics that we've done past or maybe this show. Maybe there's something you want to tell us about. Or share about uh, our feelings about this revisionism topic with Paul McCartney. And uh, again, our email is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. Also, we've gotten a couple of, uh, as you know, Ken, we've gotten some, some nice comments about the 65 show from last week. Mm hmm. Great. Yeah. So Andrew Grant Jackson was a great guest, and hopefully we'll have him on again uh, on another show. He did write another book on the solo Beatles. Uh, which you should explore, called Still the Greatest, uh, the essential songs of the Beatles' solo careers. So we thank everyone for their comments about that show. And um, I want to invite people to my website at kenmichaelsradio.com. Speaking of Andrew Grant Jackson, there's a new interview I just did with him talking about the solo careers of the Beatles, which you can find on the website. All right, anybody else want to add anything where fans can contact you? They can contact me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. Okay. And Al? I'm at, um, on Facebook at Al Sussman, on Twitter at A Sus, A S U S S 49. And, uh, the 1965 series, uh, you know, continue that every day. And, uh, uh, generally if, uh, if you come on around midway, uh, midday, uh, you'll see, you know, whatever today's entry is. Okay. And Alan? Uh, on Facebook at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, and on Twitter at at Cozen. All right, then. So on behalf of Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, and Alan Cozen, I'm Ken Michaels, thanking all of you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.